Thank you very much. There are more than 800 presentations uh, here at the meeting, and so uh, there's always a glitch now and then. Um, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, and we'll go back to the first talk, which is adrenal incidentaloma. So the, I'd like to start the talk by asking kind of an unusual question, and my question for the audience is, how are the beetles in the CT scanner uh, related, and why is it important to this talk? Well, as you know, uh, the Beatles uh, recorded for Capitol Records, and Capitol Records Recording Studio, which is where they recorded, happened to be owned by a company called EMI. EMI Limited in London also owned this building, which was a physics research institute in London, and this man working in this institute, along with the professor Tufts, invented the CAT scanner. Now, the key point here is that the money from the Beatles went through EMI specifically, and these are recorded in the board minutes, to fund the CT scan research. So that's how the Beatles and CAT scans are related. And the reason why it's important, uh, you'll see in a moment. Now, so what is EMI? Everybody thinks that the Beatles owned EMI. Wrong, the EMI owned the Beatles. Um, and EMI started off as a record company, a gramophone company, bought its competition, and this is why um, the two are related, because they were doing research into sound waves and light waves, and this was in their wheelhouse in the other parts. And so they went on to ultimately sell the CT scanner, probably a big mistake, and uh, life was good. Now, the reason why this is important is that the CAT scan is the tool by which adrenal incidentalomas are discovered. And if you go back into the, uh, into the 70s and you look at the early papers, you know, the early papers, the scans we would never tolerate today, uh, show all kinds of things. You know, it was, it was an exciting era. The problem is when you start looking, you start finding. And one of the earliest papers was reported uh, by Glazer, who said, hey, I found uh, 16 non-functional tumors in the uh, uh, adrenal gland, and he coined the term incidentaloma. So the term incidentaloma comes from the Glazer uh, paper, and you can find it in the syllabus, and he found 16 incidental non-cystic lesions performed, found in 2,200 CAT scans performed over a few years. This was an incident of 0.7%. Uh, now the interesting thing was that this was lower than in autopsy studies, which talked about the incidence of adrenal incidental tumors, although they hadn't coined the term incidentaloma, of about two to nine percent. And Glazer's recommendation at that time was, you can probably watch the smaller lesions because none of them were cancer. So that's, that's where we got started. And over the next several years, we realized that every time we scan something and find something doesn't mean that's an indication for an operation. The differential diagnosis of uh, incidental tumors of the adrenal is a, is a pretty interesting list. Now remember, there are more adrenal lesions than this, but these are the ones that are p potentially clinically inapparent uh, tumors in the adrenal gland. And of course, FIO shows up in the list, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And the list goes on to ganglion aromas and cysts and hamartomas and, and some silent cancers and the like. So there is a differential diagnosis, some of which is benign, and some of which is malignant, and the question is, well, what are you gonna do? The, most of the studies in the literature were retrospective from this initial paper about incidentalomas, and in 2002, the NIH uh, convened a consensus conference, and they made a couple of observations, a couple of high-level observations, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is right out of the consensus conference paper and um, in your syllabus, there's a direct link if you want to read it. It's a much longer document than what we'll go into uh, today. And what they determine, number one, is there isn't a lot of great information. But they do give us some insight into the controversy of why Glazer only saw 0.7% and the autopsy studies show 2 to 9% and that, that the prevalence probably increases with age. In general, autopsy studies are done on older people. And the CAT scan is, as a tool was being applied to all comers in all different age groups. So if you started CAT scanning a very elderly population, you'd find more incidental lesions. One of the things that they dwelled on, um, and I see it in my patients 
who have th uh, all kinds of lesions that you'd say, it's okay, we can watch this. The psychological impact on a patient with a four centimeter lesion uh, is under underappreciated. It's understudied, it's not clear. But you know, think about it in your own life. If you had a you know four centimeter lesion, you know, sitting in your body, and there's always just enough anecdotal experience that somebody had a cancer and the doctors were wrong and this and that. And so the psychological impact of these lesions on the patients uh, is is important and needs to be considered in the treatment plan. The rate of progression to cancer and hyperfunction, particularly for the smaller lesions that are stable, is exceedingly rare. And that's good from a science point of view. It doesn't always compute from the patient. So those are some of the high level uh, recommendations. So what they recommended, and this comes right out of the consensus conference. So if you want to you know, practice you know, consensus type standard of care medicine, is that patients should have a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test. They should have their metanephrine studied. They should have, um, if they have hypertension, measurement of serum potassium, plasma aldosterone, and the plasma renin uh, activity ratio measured. So they should be evaluated. All patients with an adrenal lesion should have a biochemical evaluation. I want to echo what, what Quan said, is that nobody should go right to the OR, and nobody should simply say, well, it's small. You know, you, you can watch this. Now, the imaging issue is, is a little bit more whoops, we gotta go back. Uh, interesting. Most patients have these lesions discovered on CT. Occasionally, you'll have somebody walk in with an MRI. And you know, things that argue towards incidentaloma or, and benign lesions are homogeneous, round, smooth masses with low attenuation of less than 10 Hounsfield's units. And that was Jeffrey Hounsfield, who I showed you uh, working uh, when he was at EMI Laboratories. What I think is particularly useful um, is to get an MRI and look at T2-weighted images. And here's a pretty good illustration of how it can be helpful. Here's a T1 image, and the lesion is dark, and pheochromocytomas, for instance, will light up like a Christmas tree on a, a T2-weighted image. And so this can be extremely helpful in trying to sort out whether or not a lesion is benign or malignant, especially when the biochemical evidence is, is not very good. If, if it's still unclear, there are some case reports of the usefulness of 123 iodine MIBG scanning, which can be as high as 95% sensitive and 100% specific uh, for pheochromocytomas. Not all studies show results quite good, but there's certainly some case literature where it was equivocal and the final diagnosis was appreciated on MIBG scanning. It is not part of my routine evaluation uh, for incidentalomas, and it's not part of the uh, NIH consensus conference, but when you're really stuck, a T2-weighted image or an MIBG scan can help you pin down the final diagnosis. Because not only are the FIO, some of them biochemically silent, some of them are intermittent. So for those challenging cases. What about size? Well, for incidental tumors, the, the history is almost nobody sits on a six centimeter tumor or greater, regardless of what the biochemical evidence is. And simply because you're gonna operate on it is not an excuse not to make sure you don't have a FIO because unplanned uh, uh, severe hypertension in the operating room is, is a bad thing. It's never a good thing for the patient. But they generally all get operated on and up to 25% of these uh, could be cancer. That's a pretty high number. Incidental tumors, on the other hand, less than three or four centimeters can be observed and hyperfunction over time is pretty uncommon. So the battleground, the controversy battleground is this three to four centimeter up to six centimeter range. And the problem is, is that the natural history of these lesions uh, is not well studied. There's not been a prospective trial. Uh, a lot of this is, you know, individual care, uh, physician bias, individualized approaches. And so there are not a, a wealth of well-designed controlled trials illustrating what exactly we should do for uh, lesions in this age range, in the size range. So if you're dealing with this intermediate group, the question is, 
how should you follow them? And the recommendation is you should strive for two stable studies greater than six months apart. So if you see a lesion, you know, that it's four centimeters and you're inclined not to operate on them because there's no evidence that you should do so, then you should get another study greater than six months apart. Have the patient come back in six months and document whether or not the lesion is stable. In the clinical question they showed, you showed an increasing, a lesion with increasing size that would have failed this criteria and would be an indication for resection um, after the workup's been done. And four years of biochemical inactivity. So what, you know, what we're saying is, is that if you're not going to operate on a patient, you're committed to following them for four years, but you're not necessarily going to say, well, I'm going to you know, CT scan you every year for the next four years. Two stable studies, follow them biochemically for a number of years, and if they pass muster, they can be um, discharged from follow-up. That's a pretty long follow-up period, and it goes back to the issues of uh, the psychological impact on the patients. And it's not dissimilar from patients that you might have with gallbladder polyps and you're ultrasounding them every now and then, trying to see if the polyp's getting bigger and they're worried about cancer. I've had a few patients just sort of drop out because they went nuts and, and couldn't deal with the fact that they had a four centimeter lesion, just said, you know, I want this out. And they've all been benign. What about functional lesions? This is the other end of the spectrum. Surgery is recommended for all clinically apparent adrenal lesions. So, you know, we want to make clear that this is a talk about incidentalomas and not a manifesto that, that you can sit on clinically apparent lesions. All patients with biochemical evidence of pheochromocytoma should be operated on from the consensus conference, but I would change that is that all patients with significant evidence, whether it be imaging evidence or I-123 studies, if there's a reasonable prospect that it's a FEO because of the possibility of malignancy, that they should come out as well. And the interesting group, and I think this is sort of the, the thought that I'll, I'll leave you with, and sort of the controversy in the battleground over the next uh, few years is, what do you do with clinically inapparent but biochemically hyperfunctioning, non-pheo non adrenal tumors, and that the long-term natural history of whether or not they should be removed or allowed to be observed has not been well worked out in prospective trials. Our bias is surgeons, and my bias is surgeons that is hyperfunctioning, and I, I tend to take it out. And as I sat there and studied the NIH consensus conference in preparation for this talk, you know, I really hadn't, hadn't even really occurred to me to leave a hyperfunctioning non pheo but clinically inapparent uh, lesion in place. So this was something that I, I gleaned from reading the consensus conference information in detail. And so the bottom line is that patients who have these lesions that you intend to sit on, you're going to be watching for at least a couple years for biochemical evidence. Two stable studies would be sufficient imaging. And if you're unclear, there are a number of steps you can go through to identify potential FEO patients for which I personally would recommend uh, resection after appropriate blockade. Thank you very much.